But we begin tonight with a manhunt for a man named Christopher Worrell. He is a Florida proud boy convicted of seven felony counts for his actions on January 6th, including physically attacking police officers and pepper spraying them. He was set to be sentenced last Friday and was likely going to face several years in prison, but he never showed up. And now no one knows where he is. And the thing that is like actually mind blowing is that despite committing violent acts against police, Worrell could go missing at all, but he could because he was allowed to leave jail and be under house arrest in Florida since November of 2021, after he claimed that he was not getting proper medical treatment for his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma while in jail. So they let him await his sentencing at home instead. Do you think that would happen to you if you were convicted of assaulting a cop, let alone a bunch of them? And one would like to believe that Christopher Worrell is unique among the MAGA faithful, getting that kind of preferential treatment, right? But sadly, no, he's not. Think about this. While more than a thousand people have been charged for their part in the January 6th insurrection, few were actually arrested on that day. Nearly all of them were free to go back to their hotels, calmly pack their luggage after breaching the Capitol and committing violent assaults, and just go home. These are people who live stream their crimes. They beat up police officers, some even defecated in the halls of Congress. And yet, only a handful were put in the back of a police cruiser that day. That gentle treatment continues to this day, where we wait for Donald Trump and 18 other defendants named in the Georgia election interference indictment to take their sweet time turning themselves in. They were given nearly two weeks to do as they please before coming in for the full treatment, the fingerprints, mugshots, et cetera. And today, Trump's attorneys met with DA Fonnie Willis's office, where they agreed to a $200,000 bond. It comes with certain stipulations. Some are common, like while on bond, Trump cannot break any state or federal laws. But his deal also comes with a unique set of stipulations about not intimidating any co-defendants or witnesses in the case that have not been applied to the bonds of any other co-defendant so far. The deal states that Trump shall not shall make no direct or indirect threat of any nature against any co-defendant, any witness, any victim, the community or any property in the community. And that the above shall include but are not limited to posts on social media or reposts of posts made by another. Now, that sure does sound like a quasi gag order to me. I do have to wonder, though. How many people caught up in our justice system get to decide, you know, when they're going to head to a police station? Which brings us to Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who was trying to move his case from state court to federal court over the weekend, uh, to federal court. But over the weekend, he upped his ask and is now looking to have his case thrown out completely, arguing, like he did in a previous filing, that he has immunity because his actions were all part of his government duties. Sure, Mark because your government job includes trying to help a president steal an election? As for Trump himself, he's showing no concern for the legal peril he's facing, spending his time on important matters, like sitting down for an interview with fired Fox anchor Tucker Carlson to run on, I guess, the Elon app or whatever, on the same night as the first Republican presidential debate later this week. I mean, these people are just going about their daily lives when just about anyone else would already be booked, arraigned, and perhaps sitting in a jail cell. Meanwhile, Trump and his MAGA friends continue to double down on the same election lies that brought us to this exact moment. You had the MyPillow guy holding yet another conspiracy conference where he, once again, accused mother-daughter election workers Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss of stealing the election in Georgia. And on his radio show, Rudy Giuliani yet again claimed to have new scientific evidence proving that widespread election fraud was real. Yes. There are things we didn't present then, because over the next, next couple of years, a lot of people did a lot of work and have been able to produce more witnesses and what I would call scientific evidence that is very persuasive. Ooh, I cannot wait to hear what that scientific evidence is. And then, of course, Trump himself continues to spew the same lies about the 2020 election, mostly in an attempt to swindle his supporters out of their money to pay his legal bills. But apparently not Rudy's. 
Joining me now is Melissa Murray, NYU law professor and MSNBC legal analyst, and Tim Miller, writer at large for The Bulwark and an MSNBC political analyst. Thank you all both for being here. Melissa, I will start with you, and let's talk about this bond situation. Um, I'm going to put them up, we, the ones we know about so far. Trump's is 200K, John Eastman, 100,000, The Cheese, Kenneth Cheeseboro, 100,000, Ray Smith, who is a Trump campaign attorney, is 50,000. Is it normal? Um, for people to be able to negotiate behind closed doors their bond? I think it's pretty unusual, although this may differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But in most cases, um, again, the rank and file criminal defendant is probably not in a great position to negotiate with the prosecutors about the terms and scope of his or her bond. So again, these are high profile defendants. Um, the nature of the case against them is going to be watched by the American public. and. It stands to reason that there are particular bond concerns that may not come into play in other cases. But again, this does seem pretty unusual. I mean, but the thing about it is one of the, uh, you know, things that I have noticed is that the MAGA people in general, including at the Capitol, were definitely treated differently. I mean, there was no big wagon where they were throwing them in after they sacked the Capitol. They went home. And now you have one mm -hmm. of them who was allowed to go home for two years, and now he's gone. I mean, good luck catching him. Maybe he's in Russia with Putin. I mean, who knows where he is? But I mean, it does seem to me, and you can tell me if I'm wrong and talk me down if I'm wrong, that they are getting special treatment all the way down to the bottom, they've had lighter sentences per some legal experts than you would have gotten for assault and assaulting a police officer. Some of them have gotten months rather than years in prison. In general, I feel like they have been treated from the bottom guy all the way to Trump very, very differently than a normal person would. Well, I think just generally what we saw on January 6th is not the kind of thing you would ordinarily see in some run-of-the-mill melee that might happen in any other part of the United States. And as you refer to in the opening bit, there was gentle treatment of all of those individuals. As we've seen, as more and more of those cases have been processed through the justice system, many of those defendants have actually gotten sentenced. And again, I'm thinking specifically of the Proud Boys litigation with Stuart Rhodes. I mean, he got a very significant sentence. So yes, there has been some evenness here, but I think there's also been some real push to make sure that individuals are held accountable and that they were held accountable, recognizing the gravity of the circumstances that they participated in. I know the government is looking for 30 years for Enrique Tarrio. Um, we'll see what happens there. And Tim Miller, you know, sort of the premise right now um, among, you know, Trump supporters and even people who are sort of soft Trump supporters is that there's, there's this two-tier justice system. All the people running against him are all using that line. And, and I would say to them, yes, there is a two-tier justice system. But Trump and his friends are benefiting from it, not being hurt by it. There is just no world in which a normal person would be treated this well with 92 felony counts facing them. And the fact that he has time to go cut an interview with the guy who got fired from Fox and the fact that he probably will, you know, so far he hasn't gotten a mug shot, even just that alone. I, I just wonder if behind the scenes, if Republicans tell you, come on, Tim, really, I know that what I'm saying is BS <laughs> because it's BS. Uh. <laughs> No, they're delusional. Actually, this you you brought you broke the news to me. I hadn't I hadn't seen that the uh, Tucker interview was pre-taped. Actually, like, this isn't even news. I like they're 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 holding it for three days, and that's supposed to be the counter programming. <laughs> anyway, that's a side point. Um, I, the two-tier justice system thing is a total farce. But I'm telling you, Joy, it is uh, right now uh, the foundational untruth of everyone in, in Republican circles. They feel like they're getting treated unfairly by the media, by, you know, the law, et cetera. Uh, it, is, it is absurd, uh, but it, it is so deep-seated that that is why none of Trump's opponents are even daring challenge it. Uh, except maybe Chris Christie, right? But like the Trump, Trump's opponents, the ones who are essentially trying to beat him, are echoing this point and saying that that you know he's being treated unfairly. You know, uh, Hunter Biden is getting a sweetheart deal. Like this is all, when it's all nonsense. I mean, it was the people in the Trump inner circle that got pardoned. Uh, Hunter got a worse deal than than Roger Stone, who had much yes. more serious crimes, or or Paul Manafort, for whom the, you know the part was uh, was pardoned after he literally was complicit in an attempt to overthrow the government. <laughs> I mean, like this all is, is crazy. Um, but but it is it is a it is a widespread belief, and it's a deeply held belief, and that's why you know all the candidates are are echoing it.
And to stay with you for a minute, Tim, I mean, I feel like it is also what gave the DOJ pause, right? There, and what gave really the response on January 6th pause. There was reporting and there was a sense that because it was MAGA people, they used kid gloves with them. Had that been, you know, Black Lives Matter protests or something else, they would have been armed to the teeth and ready. But there has been a standing down and a sort of fear of them. And I wonder what you make of that. I mean, you, 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 you have, it seems to me, to be even in the DOJ, a sense that we don't want to go too hard. Look, we have reported on this show, Hunter Biden, the fact that he was charged, that tax charge, is normally used for, like, international criminals, gangsters. Like, they don't really charge that very often. But there is this sense of we've got to be proportional and charge a Biden with something. That's how it still feels to me, that there's this attempt to really push a Hunter Biden something, 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 just to say it's been done. And still, lots of kid gloves for Trump, yet they just don't see it. Yeah, and and a couple of thoughts on that. I one, Joe Biden gets no credit for this. Right? I mean, Joe Biden left the Trump appointed prosecutor in to go after his son, and essentially you would think that he would be, you know, people would be out there praising him. That the that the more mainstream Republicans who are left would say, "Thank goodness our president's following the norms." Nothing. Like he gets nothing. He, they they get attacked. They're, they're claim Kevin McCarthy is claiming that he's orchestrating the. <laughs> Uh, indictments of Trump because of his poll numbers. I mean, the whole thing is is farcical. So, I, you know, look, I, I, my main criticism of DOJ, I do think that they could have gone after the top guys harder. Um, I, I think that, uh, thank goodness, Fonnie Willis is doing it and good good on her. Amen. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think that a lot of the foot soldiers, um, obviously the ones that committed violence, I think are being treated very, very seriously. And, and maybe, um, you know, there was a little bit of a delay on all that. But I, I do think that the DOJ is doing a good job on that part. But I bet at the top, you know, the, so the heads, the, the mob bosses here, uh, you know, they, they've got to sat around for three and a half years, and, and I don't love that.